Welcome everyone to the second video in this final unit of the first half of Calculus AB. In this video, we're going to kind of jump right into things, kind of in the middle of implicit differentiation. We're going to be building on everything we did yesterday where we learned the mechanics and motivation and technique of implicit differentiation. Today we're going to be using that technique toward four specific applications. We're going to be looking at how to construct a normal line and write its equation, as well as what one is and what one looks like. We're going to determine how to use implicit differentiation to find where curves have horizontal and vertical tangent lines, something that's pretty useful overall. And then finally, we're going to wrap things up today by looking at higher order derivatives when using implicit differentiation, and specifically the technique necessary to compute a second derivative with an implicitly defined curve, and kind of all the mechanics of that. So there's not a whole lot to build up in here. Instead, I wanted to just kind of jump back in. And in fact, of those four topics, I'm going to use the first one as an introduction to today's lesson, as well as a review of the technique of implicit differentiation. So what you're looking at here on this front page is exactly that, except for the fact that the date, I believe, is incorrect. This should be the 26th on 2019. Let's fix that. So what we're looking at here is it tells us at the beginning, like there's some information, some notes to kind of take down at the beginning on each of these. This is from an old construction of the lesson, but I kept it up here for simplicity. Basically, what we're going to start with is we're going to figure out how to construct a normal line, or specifically how to find a normal line equation. So if you're trying to think about what a normal line might look like, the best way to picture it is to think of it in relation to a tangent line. So let's say that we have a tangent line right here. Let's say that's the tangent line that we're looking for. The normal line is a line that goes through the exact same point, but it's the line that goes through that point perpendicular to the tangent line. So in a sense, they're related to each other, like the tangent line and normal line are perpendicular. And of course, there's only one line that's perpendicular to another line through a given point. So as it says up here, the normal line is the line perpendicular to the curve at a point of tangency. You may have heard about normal forces if you're taking AP Physics, I'm talking about that perpendicular force that pushes up on the ground to balance out, I think, gravity. It might be slightly off, it's been a while. But normal force relates to the normal line as well, so you can think about that perpendicular perpendicularity. And then here, the other thing to note is that the process to find it is actually really straightforward. It's going to be the exact same equation that you would get if you're finding the equation of the tangent line. Except, because the two lines are perpendicular to one another, their slopes are negative reciprocals. So our process is going to be pretty simple. We're going to find the tangent line, and then we're going to take the negative reciprocal of the slope, and we'll just write the line into the normal line. So, pretty straightforward place to start, but I figured this would be a good opening because it lets us implicitly differentiate first and kind of go through that mechanic one more time before we dig into some other stuff today. So, in our particular first example here, our kind of illustrative example, you are tasked with writing the equation of the tangent and normal lines to this curve, 5xy squared minus 3y equals 7x minus 47 at the point negative 1, 3. So, it's a good or a good problem, they gave us the ordered pair x and y, so we know our x1 and y1 were really after the slope. So if you recall, our technique to get there was to first take the derivative. And again, even though we're looking for a normal line, well, we're looking for the tangent line and normal line, we're going to need to begin by figuring out what the tangent line equation is. Just because they're so related, we might as well start with something simple. So in here, as we go to differentiate, let me point out that first and foremost, as we dig into this differentiation, I see 5xy squared, and that makes me think of the product rule. So I'm going to have to do the product rule with those pieces. So for simplicity and clarity, or I guess for clarity, not simplicity, we're going to have the derivative with respect to x of 5x times y squared, plus 5x times the derivative with respect to x of y squared. And of course, this sort of derivative with respect to x of a y thing is exactly the implicit part we've been in before. Next, we're going to be subtracting the derivative with respect to x of 3y. Well, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into that part. The derivative of negative 3y is negative 3, but because there's a y, we need a y prime. On the other side, then, we have the derivative with respect to x of 7x. That's just 7, and 47's derivative is 0. So with that in place, our next move is to just actually evaluate using the product rule. So, of course, the deriv derivative with respect to x of 5x is 5. So we get 5y squared for the first term out of the product rule. Then on the second one, we have 5x, but the derivative of y squared with respect to x is 2y, because that's how the derivative of something squared works, times the derivative of the inside, which we're calling y prime. And then, of course, we still have minus 3y prime, and it's all equal to 7. 
So with that said, we now need to combine like terms as much as possible. So looking in here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 5y squared because we've already got two things with y primes on the left side. So why not just save ourselves a little bit of trouble? I'm going to factor out a GCF of y prime. So on the left, we'll have y prime times the quantity 10xy minus 3. And on the right side, that's all equal to 7 minus 5y squared. From here, I'm going to divide now by whatever was left over from the y prime. Because again, our goal is to isolate y prime. That is our dy dx, or our slope expression, 10xy minus 3. And so what that leaves us with is our implicit derivative. We have dy dx, which again, we've been calling y prime, but it's the same thing. We established what we were differentiating with respect to. dy dx is equal to 7 minus 5y squared, all over 10xy minus 3. So again, yesterday, if that was it, we would just go, yay, look at us, we're done. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not our problem. We were tasked with finding specifically the tangent and normal lines here. So if we were asked to find the tangent and normal lines, as I sit here and change colors constantly, if we're asked to find the tangent and normal lines at a particular point, we need to use that point in order to figure out the specific slope of the tangent line. And then eventually, by consequence, the slope of the normal line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression for the slope, I'm going to evaluate it at the point x equals negative 1, y equals 3. So what that will do will give us the specific slope for our curve, for our lines. So up top, we've got 7 minus 5 times 3 squared. In the bottom, we have 10 times negative 1 times 3, all minus 3. Simplifying this, we get 7 minus 45 is negative 38. Boy, this is spicy. And this is going to be negative 30 minus 3 is negative 33. So it looks like our slope, after all, is 38 over 33. So that is the slope of the tangent line at that point. Slope of tangent line. So given that information, we now have enough to construct our first piece, which is to write out what the tangent line equation is. Our tangent line is going to be y minus 3 equals our slope, 38 over 33, times the quantity x minus a negative 1. So our tangent line, pretty easy. The second part, though, is to find our normal line. And it's normal to worry a little bit about the normal line. Haha. <laughs> but the normal line, as I said, is literally got to go through the exact same point of tangency that the tangent line does, just with that negative reciprocal slope. So to help us visually see that on here, all I'm going to do is eliminate the slope itself. So for our sake, 38 over 33, if we take the negative reciprocal, is going to become negative 33 over 38. And that's all that changes about our normal line. And so there we have our tangent line and our normal line. So in seeing this for the first time, seeing the computation, there's nothing actually new on this page except to tell you, hey, the normal line's a thing. Go get it. But at the same time, it's nice to visually see this once. I promised that you would find this line that was perpendicular to the curve at that point. Let's see if that actually looks right. So first and foremost, here is the graph of our function, or not our function, excuse me, the graph of our relation. This clearly isn't a function because it violates the vertical line test. Here is the ordered pair we were interested in. So negative 1, 3. So from here, if we start with the tangent line, we'll have y minus 3 equals, I think it was 38 over 33. I'll check and see in just a second if that was right. x minus a negative 1. There we go. Look at that. That looks pretty darn tangent, doesn't it? Like it's going through the curve right at that point. Everything's good. Now, on the other hand, though, the normal line is the exact same thing, just with the reciprocal slope, a negative reciprocal slope. And notice that. It looks like we have a perfectly made right angle right there. These two lines do, in fact, look perpendicular. And again, we're not getting into the deep applications of what a normal line gives you. But if you take enough physics classes, you'll run into the normal line and normal forces in general and the need to find perpendicular things. As well as possibly the gradient, but my mind's in other places on that. So with that said, there is the work that we've just done. So to illustrate this, let me just go ahead and copy this into our notes. Good job, us. And of course, even though we're doing this in an implicit context, you could do this with any curve or any function as well. If you can find the tangent line, you can find the normal line. It's just perpendicular. So with that said, that was our first point of attack, the normal line. Just a good opportunity to add a little bit 
to our knowledge to augment our, our stuff a little bit, as well as move forward and practice some diff implicit differentiation. Okay, the second thing that I want us to address is, well, actually the second and third things I want us to address are two properties that function or relations might have. Those are horizontal tangents and vertical tangents. Now technically we've identified and discussed these concepts before. Horizontal tangents in particular are places where we might have a relative maximum or relative minimum. Since the slope is zero, it creates that possibility, although there were some points of inflection that qualified as well. And vertical tangents were a place where we said the graph was non-differentiable, stuff like the cube root function that you've seen before, like right there in the middle, vertical tangent. Now at these, those curves, like yeah, we have a process to find them, but really for horizontal tangents and vertical tangents, they occur in very exotic and interesting places when dealing with these implicitly defined curves. And in fact, they also occur in very simple curves. For instance, I have on Desmos here a circle, and there are two vertical tangent lines at, let's see if I can do this correctly. There it is, we have two vertical tangent lines at x equals plus or minus three, and we have two horizontal tangent lines that I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure it's two, yeah, two and y equals negative four, yeah. So basically like on a circle, we have a couple different ones. So actually like these things show up pretty frequently. They're pretty common customers here for us to run into. But of course those are, that's one type of like relation. What if we went back to that other one we looked at before? Looks like there's a vertical tangent line right there at this random 6.705. So the question might be, how do we find that if we don't know much about the relation? And the truth is we can find all that information, of course, using the derivative. The derivative gives us a really good insight. So specifically to start with, talking about a horizontal tangent, we know that a horizontal tangent looks exactly like what we have up here. So here is a picture of a horizontal tangent line to a circle, of course, just for simplicity. So horizontal tan <coughs> excuse me, horizontal tangent line has slope m equals zero. And so that means what we're looking for is where the slope dy dx is equal to zero. Now when we're thinking about a slope from an implicit relation, oftentimes in our implicit relations we end up with a numerator and denominator. In this case, uh, because we want the slope to equal zero, it suffices to say that the numerator must equal zero, the denominator not, in order for this to work. So basically we're going to be looking for the numerator to be equal to zero, but as a heads up, when you're asked to justify the best way, and the way that I expect you to write this, is to state that exact first piece, that dy dx is equal to zero. Here's your y, or how if you want to say it that way. So in this case, it's going to be a matter of implicit differentiation, and then setting the numerator equal to zero. That's what it effectively amounts to. Now in our first example here, I want to do just one. I'm going to show you like horizontal and vertical and give you some different varieties of questions that could be asked from it. We are told to find the x-coordinates of the points where y cubed minus 27y minus x to the fifth equals three has a horizontal tangent line. So it's worth throwing that one up on Desmos really, really fast, just to see what it looks like. See if we should expect some of these things either. So it's equal to three, that's weird. What was the other part? Minus x to the fifth. So the question is, do we see anywhere we have a horizontal tangent line? Yeah, it looks like there is. It looks like it's flat right there, right there, and even right there. So I see a couple different points where that's gonna happen. Well, let's take a look at what the derivative gives us. So as we've done so many times before, let's copy this down, and we're going to differentiate it with respect to x. So when we do, notice there's no product rule or anything fancy in here. This is going pretty clean, I'm not overly concerned. So in digging in, we've got, it looks like, the derivative of, with respect to x of y cubed, which is three y squared, y prime minus the derivative with respect to x of 27y, which is minus 27y prime, minus the derivative with respect to x of x to the fifth, which is 5x to the fourth, no y prime because there was no y, and then three whose derivative is zero with respect to any variable. So from there, with all those pieces in place, I'm hoping you can see very quickly that we can get to our derivative and ready to solve form really fast, moving the 5x to the fourth over and GCFing out y prime, this gives us where, very quickly that y prime, otherwise known as dy dx, is going to be equal to 5x to the fourth divided by 3y squared minus 27. So voila, everything's good. Now our issue here is of course we're trying to figure out 
when this is equal to zero so that we know when the slope is horizontal. Well, if we set that equal to zero, as we set up above, the denominator being negative 17 or some other number isn't gonna to contribute to the zeroness that's here. So instead, we just need to set the numerator, 5x to the fourth, equal to zero. And voila, very easy to see that if 5x to the fourth equals zero, it means that x equals zero. Now in here, we have our answer. We found the x coordinate of the points where that curve has a horizontal tangent line. The interesting thing though, was that when we looked at the picture, it looks like there's multiple points. It looks like there's literally three spots. Heck, there might even be more. Nope, it just looks like there are three spots here. So the question is, did we do this correct or is there some sort of mistake? And the answer is, yes, we did it correctly because x equals zero is exactly where each of those spots is where the curve has a horizontal tangent line. Each one happens to lie along that line. So in a sense, we've actually already found all those different values found that there were actually three that were in there and they all occur when x equals zero so i guess for the sake of argument let's copy this in so again can't be fooled in this case by the fact that there are multiple places where are multiple ordered pairs we were just asking for the coordinate and it just happens that all of the coordinates happen to have x equals zero as their um, left coordinate so covered nicely, there it is. Horizontal tangent line, I think it's pretty simple because we've used these guys a lot. You can see that there's lots of different, there's lots of different scenarios in which these guys pop up. And we got to see a good example here as well. So voila, there's horizontal tangent. Now, we looked at a horizontal tangent and found just the coordinate of all the points where it was there, but that doesn't have to be the way we asked the question. And in fact, on our next one, you're actually asked to find all the points x comma y where this implicit curve has a particular type of tangent line. So in our second one though, we're gonna look at vertical tangent lines. And in a vertical tangent, as you can see over on the side, vertical tangents occur when there is no horizontal change, but the vertical change keeps happening. So there is a vertical tangent line. And again, our slope in that case is going to be, if I can write my pen, there it is. Our slope in this case is undefined. It's some number divided by zero because dy would be a number and dx would be zero since it's not horizontally moving. So as it says up there, a vertical tangent occurs when the slope is undefined or is some number over zero. For our purposes though, the way we're going to justify and explain and demonstrate our understanding of this is we're gonna look at it as the reciprocal of dy dx has to equal zero because that way it avoids us having to write awkward things like equals undefined or equals number over zero. It'd be better to just simply write dx dy equals zero. The horizontal change is going to be zero over any vertical change. So effectively then, that means that what we need to do is figure out when the denominator of the derivative is equal to zero, because that would give us that chance where the horizontal change is zero. So for this particular problem, I believe it's the exact same problem as before. So I'm gonna go ahead and cheat and pull in the slope that we already found. Oh, come on, really? That's what I want, whatever. So there is the slope that we calculated before. We don't need to do it twice just because it's there. But then I am gonna point out that since we were talking about dx dy being equal to zero, that implies to us that dx dy, which is equal to the reciprocal, three y squared minus 27, all over five x to the fourth, is what needs to be equal to zero. And simply put, that means the numerator now, the new, putting the new in numerator, ever since turning the page, that means 3y squared minus 27 has to equal 0. And of course, with a little bit of factoring work, we get that 3 quantity y squared minus 9 has to equal 0, which means that we're actually going to have two separate y values in this case. We're going to get y equals negative 3 and y equals 3. So there's a good starting spot. We've definitely gotten good information out of this. We now know that the points or the lines where these will occur are both along plus or minus three. But the interesting thing, as always, is that we've only found and calculated the y coordinate. Like we're missing what those x coordinates happen to be. So in order to do that, we need to go back and do something that we did at the very end of yesterday's lesson in the triad. We need to go back to our original equation and see what happens when y equals negative three or y equals three. And again, this sometimes feels like it's even the hardest part of the problem. It's not actually the implicit differentiation because you know those mechanics. It's actually doing the algebra to come back and figure out what those other values are. So let's do one at a time here. Let's start with y equals negative three. 
if y equals negative 3, what does that mean about x? Well, again, our relationship is right here. So if I plug in negative 3, I'll have negative 3 cubed minus 27 times negative 3 minus x to the fifth equals 3. Doing some solving work, we get negative 27 plus 81 minus x to the fifth equals 3. Moving some stuff around, what's that going to be? 54, yeah, 54. So we get 54 minus x to the fifth equals 3. And moving some stuff around, that will give us that x to the fifth is equal to 51. So given that, we just need to now solve this for x. And I'm hoping this isn't too big a deal or too big a step to point out that x is going to be equal to the fifth root of 51. So one such point for us is going to be the point fifth root of 51, comma, negative 3. There is one such point. So now we're alleging that there's a vertical tangent line at this point. So let's go check on Desmos really fast. I think we already had that curve ready. We did. So if we put in that point, it was the fifth root of 51. So I'm going to put into the thing 51 to the 1 fifth, comma, negative 3. And the question is, does that look like a vertical tangent line? Oh, heck yes, it looks like a vertical tangent line. Look at that. That definitely looks vertical to me. It looks like, in fact, we've done a good job. And we've got our first one of those vertical tangents. But of course, as we saw, there should be another one. And in fact, we know that we should expect it to occur at y equals 3. So if you're comfortable, feel free to work ahead of me on the second one. I'm going to try to go through it really fast. But we found our first. Now our question is, what happens with the second? So to get that second, we'll do the exact same thing. We're going to look at y equals 3. So if y equals 3, then we get 3 cubed minus 27 times 3 minus x to the fifth equals 3. Move stuff around, that's 27 minus 81, which is negative 54, minus x to the fifth equals 3. And doing a little bit of algebra really quick in my head, that's going to be 57. I think we're going to get x equals the negative fifth root of 57, which then gives us our second point, but this time with positive 3 as its y-coordinate. So with that said, we now allegedly have our second point. Again, we can use Desmos really fast to check it out and make sure this is reasonable. So that's negative 57 to the 1 fifth comma 3. Oop. And look at that. It looks like we once again did our job. Pulling this out. Let's see if that looks accurate. Yep. Looks like we found that one as a vertical tangent as well. So basically, again here, if we're looking at vertical tangents, I don't think the mechanics of doing this work are particularly difficult. I think what makes this challenging is just the fact that you sometimes need to go a little bit further to answer the full question. So in our case here, first for a vertical tangent, we wanted it to be all vertical change and no horizontal change, which means we want the denominator to equal zero. But formally speaking, that means we want dx dy to equal zero. After that, we do our implicit differentiation like before, or benefit from having already done the problem. Then from there, we set the denominator equal to zero, solve that, and whatever coordinates we get, we plug into the original equation, and then solve for the other coordinate, so that that way we can find the missing x value, or y value, whatever the case may be. So there are vertical tangents to go along with our horizontal tangents and our normal lines so far. Moving forward, the last big new thing that we want to hit before we kind of work through a couple harder problems and let you take your hand at the wheel, is we want to talk about computing higher order derivatives using implicit differentiation. Now, most practically speaking, these are typically valuable because of the fact that they allow us to determine the concavity of a curve. So that if we were trying to sketch values, we might be able to determine some extra information. In addition, there have also been problems that have popped up on previous free response sections in the last few years, where you use that second derivative to use the second derivative test in a sense, to check whether or not a point happens to be a relative maximum or relative minimum relative to the neighborhood of points that it's around. So there's a couple different reasons to get there for the second derivative. For anything higher, they're too computationally crunchy for us to actually work through. So in this course and probably beyond, you're only going to be asked to compute the second derivative in all likelihood, or move from the second derivative to the third or something like that. Um, but basically where I wanted to start was just kind of work through the mechanics of this, because in reality, this is the one thing that's kind of got something new going for it. Everything else is just kind of little twists and extensions of things we already knew before. So to start things off, I've given us kind of a blanket middle, middle road example. 
We're asked to compute dy dx, or d2y over dx squared for the curve y cubed minus x squared equals 11. And our question is, is the curve concave up or concave down at x equals 4? Now, I will let you in on a little secret. This particular relationship, or this particular relation, can be done explicitly if you solve for y and then work from there. It's messy, but it can be done. At the same time, I want to use something that's a little computationally doable for our first example so that you kind of get a feel for what this technique looks like. So as I've done many times before, and usually with narration, this is going to be one of those situations where we're starting with something that's very simple so that, that way we can build out this technique and the mechanics and the computation of what we're doing. So forgive me for that small bit of deception, but since I told you, is it really deception? Mm -hmm. Don't think it is. So moving on from here, we want to compute the second derivative. So as I've done before, I'm going to give you a nice little plan for everything we hit here. The first step of this plan is, well, since we don't have a first derivative, if we want to get to the second derivative, we always have to go through the path of the first. So we first are going to need to differentiate implicitly. And why we do that is so that we can get dy dx. So we're trying to get just the traditional slope dy dx before we do anything else. Uh, let's see. There. So to do that, we're going to begin by taking the derivative with respect to x of this relation that happens to be in, que in question. And naturally, my computer decides to bring is with, or a dot 15. So there we go. Actually, the derivative would be the same, wouldn't it? But, oh, well. So from there, we're going to take the derivative. So moving forward, derivative of y cubed, you should be able to do that in your head now. That's 3y squared y prime, or dy dx minus 2x equals 0. And from there, this becomes very easy to solve. I'm going to add 2x to both sides and divide by 3y squared. We're going to get that dy dx, which of course we know as y prime, is equal to 2x divided by 3y squared. So, oh, I forgot an equal sign. That's a joy. Let's move this up a little bit. There we go. Boom. Okay, so there's our first bit. We found the first derivative, good for us. We could write a tangent line, whatever we might want to do. Okay, our next move. The next thing that we're going to hit here is we're now going to do as we did before. Well, technically, I guess I already did that. Like we solved for y prime. So instead, we're going to move forward. And since we've done the derivative once, we're going to, of course, do it again. If we want a second derivative, we take a second derivative. So in this case, we're going to differentiate, but because there's still x's and y's in there, we're going to differentiate implicitly again. So this is going to feel a little bit different. It's a little awkward. And more than that, take a look at our new derivative. If this is the thing we're differentiating, we've got 2x over 3y squared. So in a sense, what we're going to do is we're going to take that expression, going to differentiate with respect to x dy dx, and then we're going to take the derivative with respect to x of 2x over 3y squared. So on the left side, if we differentiate again, we get d2y over dx squared, the second derivative of y with respect to x. On the right side, though, we've now got a function over another function, which I don't know about you, but that screams to me quotient rule. In fact, if you listen carefully, you can hear it. Quotient rule. Wow, I hear it out there. It's literally screaming. Anyhow, we're using the quotient rule. So in here, I'm going to be super careful that, again, I'm going to use the song. Because it's a quotient rule opportunity, why not sing the song? <clears throat> song I learned in high school, by the way. Low, i got to start. Low, D, high. Again, I'm playing it really carefully now. Minus high, D, low. All over er, low, low quotient rule. There we go. So there's our derivative, aside from the fact that it won't let me like straighten that line out, which is going to irritate the heck out of me. Ha, huh, take that. Take that system. Nice try. You thought you could win over me. No such luck, my friend. Okay, it doesn't look that great, but whatever. Okay, so there is our second derivative. So, yay us, we did a great job, huh? Yeah, except here's the problem. When we go to work our way through this derivative, looking at our pieces, the first part's not bad. This derivative is 2, which means we're going to get 6y squared. On the second one, we're going to get minus 2x 
times it looks like 6y. And then because we're differentiating implicitly and we're taking the derivative of a y expression with respect to x, we're going to have to multiply by y prime. All of that then is going to be over 9y to the fourth. So, no, I mean, I guess it wasn't that bad. Like, okay, the fact that it won't let me straighten out that line is irritating. But that's, I guess, how things go. The thing that I want to point out here is that there's something really awkward that happened in our derivative. Maybe it's not even catching your eye just yet. Take a look at this expression, which is our d2y over dx squared, our second derivative. What do you notice that's just kind of in there that just quite doesn't belong? Does anyone see something that's kind of strange to have in a derivative? I'm hoping that what you said out loud, because I can't possibly know, is the y prime. y prime is our problem here. The fact that there's a y prime there is a little bit awkward. And it is, in fact, very awkward. Because, of course, we want to have our derivative in terms of the same variables we had before. So we can't leave a y prime in there. That's kind of our creation. So instead, what we do is it brings in the one really new step and mechanical move that we have to do here, which is we need to find a way to replace y prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to back substitute. Hmm, that's almost what they were doing my surgery for, a back substitute. Well, more approving the back, but whatever. We're going to back substitute for y prime. And the reason is we want this entire derivative to be in terms of x and y. Again, we know some information about this graph, so we want to make sure that we're in the right spot. So in looking here, you might ask, though, for a second, like, wait, what's y prime? Like, they gave us this expression at the beginning, but what was y prime? Well, the answer to that question is right here. It was the first derivative that we found using implicit differentiation. So y prime in our case is this guy. So we need to make sure to plug that in to our derivative. So to help us with that, I'm going to go ahead and attempt to steal this. So I'm going to continue the problem up here. Naturally, it doesn't let me bring the lines at all. Are you kidding me? <sighs> Excuse me. Oh, and it didn't even bring the derivative. OK. So we are going to try to back substitute up here. And we're going to back substitute for the y prime that was right there. So digging in, y prime is 2x over 3y squared. So this is the expression that we need to work our way through. Now technically, just as a heads up, if you were asked merely to compute the second derivative, then this would be efficient, like sufficient. That would be your answer. That's perfectly acceptable. It's completely in terms of x and y. It's just not simplified. But simplifying isn't really our game. Still, for our purposes, we want to start talking about concavity. We're going to have to compute things with this. So I want to clean it up as much as humanly possible. So my next move is to work on that step. So combining some stuff together, it looks like, well, here, I can do some simplifying. Actually, I'll write this out as clean as possible. This is 4, 6, 24. So it looks like it's going to be minus 24 x squared y over 3y squared, all over 9y to the fourth. So basically, there is our second version, starting to get cleaned up a little bit. From here, I'm just going to go ahead and say that we should probably just simplify and start cleaning it up. So for, I'm going to say simplify, like basically tidy up. Because again, we're going to need to plug some stuff in. We want this as clean and clear as possible. So as far as simplifying here, the 24 over 3 will become an 8. The y over y squared, the y in the numerator is gone. And this gives us instead 6y squared minus 8x squared over y, all divided by 9y to the fourth. At this point, we're pretty good. Like, that's readable. But of course, within here, in this tidying up, I'd like it to just be a single fraction. It's just easier to work with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a common denominator. I'm using just a different version of red here. So in doing that move, I end up with instead 6y cubed minus 8x squared all over y and all over 9y to the fourth. But we've run into this situation many times before, fraction over another fraction, which means you can just multiply those denominators together. So as far as pieces here, our new denominator is going to be 9y to the fifth. And our numerator, the only thing I can do is pull out a GCF of 2, and I might as well because we're here. We're going to have 2 times quantity 3y cubed minus 4x squared. And so this would be my boxed answer for my second derivative. 
So that's a good starting spot. It's a good thing to have. It did tell us to compute dy d2y over dx squared. So I'm going to leave that there. That only hits, though, our first part of the problem. Our second part was to actually figure out what was happening at x equals 4. So is this concave up or concave down? Well, to do that, we need to find the ordered pair x comma y where we're actually interested. And basically what I see is if x equals 4, then that's going to imply that y cubed minus 4 squared is equal to 11. And hopefully you can see that that means y cubed equals 27 or y equals 3. So our ordered pair here is going to be the point 4 comma 3, with 4 being x and 3 being y. Given that, our job will be to then just compute what the second derivative is equal to at that point. See, can I pull that over? Yes. Haha, <laughs> finally something cooperated on this thing, almost. So here is our second derivative that we're looking at. We want to figure out what this is equal to at the point 4 comma 3. Well now, we finally just boiled this down to arithmetic. It's going to be 2 times, let's see, 3 times 37, that's 81, minus 4 times 4 minus 64, all over 9 times 3 to the 5th. Well, at this point, these numbers are kind of large, so I don't really want to continue. But remember, we're asking about concave up or concave down. All that means is we need to know if the second derivative is positive or negative. So at this point, what I can see is that for sure, this derivative, or the second derivative, 2 times 17 over 9 times 3 to the 5th, is clearly positive. So I don't even need to calculate its value. And in fact, doing so would be a risk, because if I did it wrong and got the wrong value, I could actually lose points or lose that credit for my work. So instead, now that we've seen that the second derivative is positive at this point 4 comma 3, we can now say the curve is concave up. And our reason would be because d2y over dx squared is greater than 0 at that point. So again, I added a little bit to this question from what I'd done in past years. I wanted that concavity question to pop up, so that, that way there was a reason for this sort of analysis. For the moment, though, you can consider it as almost kind of a differentiation challenge. Like you're trying to move forward, you're trying to back substitute, you're trying to differentiate implicitly not once but twice, including a very likely situation involving the quotient rule. So lots of challenge in there, but again, something that I think you're more than capable of and ready to do. So quick recap here of the second derivative process. We take the derivative implicitly first, looking at that in the light lavender purple. Then second, we differentiate implicitly again, and that will of course produce a second instance of y prime within our stuff. That was us moving through the pink. From there, once we get any y primes, we back substitute for y prime using our original first derivative to make that substitution so that our second derivative is completely in terms of x and y only. And then finally, we simplify and tidy up and answer any other questions that might pop up. Well, having done that, we've seen all the different like techniques that are really out there that we're going to be attacking today. So I just want to go through and do a couple more little things. First, I want to hit a problem that involves some extra little challenge to it and uses your graphing calculator, since so far everything's been kind of non-calculator active, or calculator inactive, whatever the case may be. Then I want to give you kind of an upper level challenging kind of try it problem, since I think there will be some extra time in class today, something where you can really grapple with the techniques here and kind of see some comprehensive work that you might run into. So without delay, let's jump into the first of those situations. So this is going to be the final example example of today's lecture. And this is a calculator active question, so you're allowed to use a calculator. And in fact, you're going to need a calculator. You can deny it and avoid it all you want. It's going to come back and bite you if you don't. So in our situation here, we are asked to find the point x comma y at which the graph of the curve below has a vertical tangent line. So that's our challenge, is we want to figure out where that vertical tangent line occurs. So we've done this before. We know how to find a vertical tangent line. It's just going to be an issue of, of course, as we've seen before, finding that point using a graphing calculator or in a situation where you can't do it by hand. So jumping in here, the first thing I want to do is I want to differentiate implicitly. Like, that seems like a pretty safe bet on the beginning of this unit. In fact, I think almost every problem you're going to differentiate implicitly somehow. Excuse me. So taking the derivative with respect to x, I see a couple little pieces here. First and foremost, we're going to have 2y, y prime. Then on the second term, by the way, this is a little bit of an adventure. We have the sine of 2y, which is, of course, implicit, so it's a chain rule problem. But there's really a chain rule built in here, too, because the derivative of 2y is 2y prime. 
So for that one, as we take our derivative, we can think about that in terms of the way the chain rule works. The derivative of sine of stuff is going to be cosine of that stuff. But then we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is going to be 2y prime. So again, that can throw some people a little bit. That's why I want to make sure you threw one in there. Then, of course, it'll be 3y prime for the last term. On the other side, everything's in terms of x or a constant. So 3x squared minus, oops, minus a negative sine of x plus 0. So this is nicely aligned. Like, you're welcome for the beautifully written function or relation. All the y's are on one side, so that was y's of me. So we can very quickly, I think, get to our answer. We'll have 2y plus 3 minus 2 cosine of 2y. And that's all equal to 3x squared plus sine of x. So doing a little bit of solving and dividing, we're going to get that y prime or dy dx is equal to 3x squared plus sine of x all over 2y plus 3 minus 2 cosine of 2y. So that is our implicit derivative. But remember, we were asked specifically for where this curve has a vertical tangent line. So that means what we need to figure out is where dx dy is equal to 0. And in looking at this, that means that we really want to figure out where that denominator is equal to 0. So we need to solve the equation 2y plus 3 minus 2 cosine of 2y is equal to 0. Now, I don't know about you, it's certainly possible that you are the greatest algebraic solver in the history of the world. So I don't, don't take this as an offense otherwise. But there's no way we're going to be able to solve that by hand. Therefore, what we're going to need is to pull out our graphing calculator and let our graphing calculator help solve that. Now, there is a little bit of an element of strangeness to this. What we're going to do is we need to solve this equation in terms of y, but our graphing calculator doesn't let us graph functions in terms of y. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that this is x. So instead of 2y plus 3 minus 2 cosine of 2y, we're going to put in 2x plus 3 minus 2 cosine of 2x. And the reason being, then when our graphing calculator solves for the 0, it'll give us an x value. We'll just have to remember that that's actually a y value. So with that put in there, we can zoom 6. I see that there's one single place where this hits the x-axis, 1, 0. So we'll do left bound and right down. Let's go like negative 4, 0, and I don't know, negative 2. And it tells us our 1, 0 is negative 2.0593. And of course, it says an x value. We know this is a y value, negative 2.0, make sure I do this correctly, 5937. And again, at this point, we know we're going to need to use this again since we're trying to find the x and y coordinates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let my graphing calculator store that value. It's saved in there right now as x. Notice there it is as x. I'm going to store that x value as b. And then we're going to know that b is our y value that we're looking for. So in fact, in my work, I can now set this equal to b, and then I can use it as b everywhere else in my calculation. So that's the first essential piece of work that we've been able to do. Now for our second, what we need to do is we need to find the x value by going back to our original equation. Oh, it's magically highlighted already for me, cool. So we need to go back to that original equation. So since this is our y value, we're gonna plug in that b value, negative 2.059, et cetera, into y for each of those spots. So the equation we're going to solve is b squared minus sine of 2b, or not to be, that is the question, plus 3b is equal to x cubed minus cosine of x minus 3. And again, from here, we're just going to use our graphing calculator once again to solve. So pulling it in, we can go back into the y equals. We can put in our b squared minus sine of 2b. And again, I'm using literally b, that way we don't have to carry it out, we don't have to round any intermediate calculations. Plus 3b, then we're going to have x cubed minus cosine of x minus 3. Let's make sure I do all this correctly. It is. Okay, so from here we're going to see if we can get a uh, an intersection here. Yes, there's one intersection. Pulling these pieces together, second calc, we'll go to intersect, enter, enter, enter. And it says our x-coordinate is 0 0.938. So there is apparently our x-coordinate. And what that means is we have 
what appears to be the point where our vertical tangent line occurs. So we are expecting that this curve should have a vertical tangent line at 0 0.938 comma negative 2.059. So a good question to ask is, well, okay, does it? Does it actually have one there? Well, let's go ask Desmos really fast. Ignore that work that was there. I had an incorrect mistake. I'm redoing this part of the video. So in looking here, we've got our ordered pair. I can see the spot where I'm expecting there to be a vertical tangent line. It looks like it occurs right down there in quadrant four. Putting these pieces in, we'll have 0 0.938. And I think our Y value is negative 2.059. And look at that. We do in fact seem to have found our vertical tangent line spot. So I think that we did a nice job there. Again, this was a little bit of a challenge though. It required us to go through and actually use our graphing calculator in some creative ways. And I think it might've been our first opportunity to see that we were solving for a Y value using our graphing calculator, treating it as an X value. So with that said, there is our vertical tangent line, kind of the worst that you could possibly get for this situation. But again, I think it's something that you're ready for and something that you can do. Okay, at this point we've seen everything in this lesson. So basically what I'd invite you to do is to work through an extended try it. In this try it, there's a little bit of everything. There's some normal line work, there's some special tangent line work, and then there's a second derivative problem involving concavity. So really it's just an opportunity to give yourself one more test in a really supportive environment. So I'm going to encourage you to work through this try it and to um, pause the video so that that way afterwards you can come right back to the video and then just kind of see how the problems are done and compare your answers. So if you haven't already, please, in order to give you time to work, pause the video now. Okay, welcome back. So let's take a look at the answers to these questions. I don't think any of them were trivial, although again, the first one is probably the easiest out of the three. So in jumping in here, I'll first start with the first curve that we were analyzing, 5y equals x squared plus 8 cosine y minus 6x. We were first tasked with writing the normal line equation at it says the minimum x value where y equals zero, and we weren't supposed to use a calculator. So in here, what I started with in my work was I began by going through and calculating out what those x values could possibly be. After plugging in y equals zero, I found that x could either be two or four, and since we wanted the minimum one, that meant x had to be equal to two. That locked in our ordered pair as two comma zero, which just gave us a head start to everything else. After that, it was a pretty standard implicit differentiation problem. I got my derivative in terms of both x and y. I found that the tangent line had sloped negative two fifths at that point two comma zero, and that just meant that our normal line had the negative reciprocal slope of five halves. So you could even have written this as y equals five halves x minus five. That would have been fine too. So that gets us our first one. Again, I think that was clearly the easiest out of those, but again, little places to look through. Did you find the correct x value? Did you compute the correct slope? And then did you remember to take the negative reciprocal of the tangent line slope that you calculated? So I'd say those are the key areas to look for. In part B, you were asked to find the three points where the tangent line is horizontal. And it was told that a calculator was fine to use here. The first part, the first coordinate, the x coordinate was actually really easy. We wanted the derivative dy dx to equal zero. And again, you need to show that that needs to be part of your communicated work and presented solution. So with that said, we were just trying to solve two x minus six equals zero, which meant x equals three. Once we got x equals three though, we had to solve for y in an equation that we could not handle without a graphing calculator. So from there, we had to solve the equation five y equals eight cosine of y minus nine. But I found that when I graphed that on my calculator, it was really hard to see. So instead I moved it all over to a single side and looked for zeros. And then that gave me very quickly my three zeros. Quickly is a relative word, it didn't take go that quick. But that did give me my three ordered pairs, three comma negative 0.25, 3 comma negative 1.158 and 3 comma negative 3.361, which added up correctly with what I saw on my graphing or on my Desmos as well as um, what the curve itself looks like. So again, in that second one, it was a matter of communicating that definition. Again, we're looking for kind of like points that I would award, like you get a point awarded there, get a point for the correct equation or the x value of three. Probably that'd be one point, but setting that aside. After that, you get a point for plugging into the equation x equals three and then a point for getting all the solution points. So again, very good question, an excellent question. Uh, I just wish it didn't have three solutions to find. I'd rather it be the more time, less time intensive. So there were A and B. Now for C, C took a little bit of work, but it was kind of a tricky one. There was no actual X in there when you took the derivative. So it was kind of a clean problem for the most part. So in here, of course, we were trying to find the second derivative and then address concavity of this curve at a particular point. 
in digging through what we had up there, I took the derivative implicitly and ended up getting that y prime equals one over three y squared minus six. Now that's an interesting one because while we could use the quotient rule to differentiate, there's no x left over and the numerator is a constant, which meant I could equally well attack this by writing it in kind of chain rule form as something to the negative one power. So that was the way I addressed the problem from there and took the second derivative is I used the chain rule. When I did, I ended up getting, a, I mean, you can see all the work down here. I did have to do implicitly with the chain rule. Eventually I got negative one over three y squared minus six squared times six y y prime from the derivative of the inside. And then it was just a matter of back substituting that original expression. And that cleaned things up again. And in this case, I think I got as my, my second derivative negative 12 over 216. But again, I don't care what that simplifies to. I can tell that it's negative though. So that was all I needed to conclude that this curve is concave down at four comma two. And now I didn't actually check this one. So you know what the heck, we're here. While we're looking, I will pull this out really fast. Let's see what we have here. If we put in x plus six y equals y cubed plus six. Yep. So we were interested in what the concavity looked like at the point four comma two. And it looks like I made an error when I wrote the question and I don't actually have the point on there. Does four comma two not check? Oh well, my mistake. So I don't think that was supposed to be a six. Let's see, four comma two. Well, beside the point, I'll have to address that. So um, aside from the fact that I made a mistake on this constant at the end on this equation, everything else worked out nicely. So just a quick little refresh is probably in order. As a reminder, we really developed four new skills or new things and aspects, properties to look at. First one was the idea of a normal line, which is the line through the point of tangency and perpendicular. The technique was the same as the tangent line, except we took the negative reciprocal of the slope. Second, we looked at horizontal tangents, something we've done before. In this case, we set the numerator of dy dx equal to zero, or we set dy dx equal to zero, and then we solve. Second, we addressed how to find a vertical tangent line, which is when the denominator is equal to zero. We talked about the importance of communicating dx dy equals zero to make sure we know it's there. And of course, then we actually went back and solved for some of the missing coordinates. It was just kind of, you know, they didn't come out real purdy, but that's okay. They did work and we were fine. After that, we talked about the second derivative. And I'd say this was the most like algebraically intensive thing that we probably go through this entire half of the course. Basically, our technique was to differentiate implicitly and then do it again, remembering that anytime we end up with a y prime, we can back substitute our original first derivative. And in doing so, we get a nice expression for the conca concavity in terms of x and y, which we can then plug into and work from there. And then finally, we did a couple examples where the graphing calculator was our friend, helping us find actual coordinates from equations that we couldn't find otherwise. And then we did that massive triad. So with that said, that completes the second implicit differentiation lesson. Tomorrow, assuming tomorrow isn't a weekend, I don't have a calendar handy, we will begin looking at how we can apply this to some more realistic contexts rather than these purely like graphical and kind of geometric -y kind of applications. So without further ado, as a reminder, like if you need extra assistance and extra tips, like the video solutions for your homework assignment are available online already. You can take a look at some of those harder problems especially and see how they're done. But with that said, Again, I wish I was there with you, but hopefully this has been a sufficient replacement to kind of help support your learning. As always, I'm Mr. Steele. Have a great day.